Who here has heard the word blockchain? Hands, please. That's great. This is 1993 to me. I used to stand up and say, who's heard the word World Wide Web? And every time I ask an audience that, I get more and more hands. Those of you who didn't put up your hands, you may remember the first time you heard the word internet, and maybe you'll remember today for a similar reason. Because once again, the technology genie has been released from its bottle, summoned by an unknown person or persons named Satoshi Nakamoto. This genie is now available at our disposal to rewrite the economic order of things and to transform society for the better, if we will it. Let me explain. I had a sobering experience a couple of years ago when I had to reread my 1994 book, The Digital Economy, which some of you may remember was the first bestseller about the web in business. And in that book, I talked about this is an age of vast new promise and opportunity. It's also an age of peril and of danger. And I talked about some things that could go wrong. I said that technology will deliver many wonders, but it's possible that we'll have growing wealth creation, but also growing social inequality. It's possible that this will stimulate our economy and that there'll be GDP growth, but there won't be a commensurate growth in jobs, and the technology may actually undermine job creation. I said that surely the biggest asset of this digital age will be data a new asset class. But it's possible that that data will not be owned by us, the creators of that data. It will be owned by powerful institutions that will not only prevent us from monetizing our own asset, but that will use this data, whether or not they're large corporations or governments, to undermine our privacy, which is the foundation of a free society. Well, I've. I was kind of shocked in reviewing the state of things to realize that these had all occurred. The digital age has brought us many wonders, but when you look at the bottom line of how it's impacted our economy and society, it's a troubling report. What if there were a second generation of the internet? See, the first generation was the internet of information. We exchanged information, peer-to-peer -peer. information being words or emails or pictures or sounds or music or videos and so on. But that internet wasn't actually all that good for business and it wasn't good for peer-to-peer -peer value creation because we couldn't exchange value or money. What if there were a new generation where we could exchange value peer-to-peer Surely that would be a radical thing. Because the benefits and the largesse of the digital age to date have been asymmetrical. They've been captured by powerful forces. Well, it turns out that the next generation of the internet is, sorry, I didn't have that slide on the screen, is in fact based on the underlying technology of Bitcoin. Now, when you think about Bitcoin, the first thing that comes to mind is an asset. It's like gold. Will it go up or down? I don't think that should be of huge interest to you unless you're a speculator in commodities. Bitcoin is something larger. It's a digital currency or cryptocurrency that's not created or controlled by nation states. That's of much more interest. But what is of huge and should be of huge interest to you is the underlying technology called the blockchain. This is the greatest innovation in computer science to me in a generation, and it holds vast new potential. Now, the, the blockchain is basically a large distributed ledger. It's a distributed database and it runs on many, many computers, ultimately hundreds of millions of computers. 
And it's open source, so anyone can change and add to the underlying capabilities of the protocol. Think of a global spreadsheet. And this is a spreadsheet where information can be stored in a way that's immutable and uncorruptible and unchangeable. Because if you wanted to hack a transaction, let's say I pay $20 and I want to send that same, I just sent that file to JP, and I also want to send that same file to, uh, to Matthew, I would have to do that in the full light of the most powerful computing resource in the world. Some people say that all of Google's servers in the world are equal to 5% of the computing power of the blockchain. I'd, I'd not only have to hack that on a computer, and all large computers are hackable, I'd have to hack that across all of the hundreds of thousands and ultimately millions of computers on the blockchain. And I'd have to hack it for that block, that little 10-minute block. It's kind of like a heartbeat of the network. When a transaction occurs, peer-to-peer -peer collaboration called miners use a clever code to solve a mathematical problem. And they use a lot of computing power to do that. And the first to find out the truth and to achieve consensus on the network for that block gets paid some money, digital currency, usually Bitcoin. But that block, that 10-minute block, is linked to the previous block, which is linked to the previous block. So if I wanted to hack this transaction, I'd have to do it across all of these computers, not just for that 10-minute block, but for the entire history of commerce on that blockchain. This is not practically possible. So here we have a global, unhackable, distributed database that's enriched with a currency. And that holds some pretty far-reaching potential. Now, the Bitcoin blockchain is one blockchain, and it's the most important blockchain. There's lots of controversy about it, and has been off and on, but there are others. One that I'm particularly interested in is called Ethereum. And it's a blockchain that has a whole bunch of value-added capability that enables developers to rapidly build capability on top of it. Just before Christmas, I spoke at the Ethereum Developers Conference, and I walked into a room about five times the size of this, and there were people in every seat lined up two deep all along the sides and all along the back. The smartest computer scientists, as in 1993, the smartest VCs, the smartest academics, the smartest entrepreneurs have figured out that there's something big that's going on here. And in the audience were people that were building a new model of a stock exchange, people who were transforming the music industry so that artists get comp for the value that they create. There were people building an entirely new set of systems for the banking uh, world. There were people building personal identities that are portable and in a black box that can protect your privacy. In that room, were people building apps touching virtually every aspect of our economy and of our society. Now, lots of other people have got into this. The Economist wrote a cover story uh, on it. They called it the great chain of being sure about things or the trust machine. I've been calling it the trust protocol. And the banking industry is big time into this as well. Now, the banks view this as an opportunity not to radically change the global power grid. They view it as an opportunity to deal with a very fundamental problem in banking, that we have this Rube Goldbergian model of financial <laughs> services systems, where you tap your little card in Starbucks and a bit stream goes through um, like a dozen different computers, some of them being 1970s mainframes, and three days or four days later, a settlement occurs for this transaction. Well, the opportunity for the banks is with these distributed ledgers, there is no settlement. Everyone's looking at the same database. I pay you, the transaction is settled. 
So this could radically not just simplify the entire banking system, it could create a whole bunch of new value-added capability as well. So uh, this just came up this morning. It's the website uh, for my new book. The book is called Blockchain Revolution, how the underlying technology, or the technology under behind Bitcoin is changing money, business, and the world. I wrote the book with a 29-year-old uh, investment banker and technologist, a very brilliant guy. His name is Alex Tapscott. And um, <laughs> look, you can pre-order the book and get some benefits. The best way to pre-order this book is in massive volume, by the way. <laughs> Christmas, not that far away. Think about it. Seriously. We're done? Again. Again. Oh, we're back up again. Imagine that we move to an age of distributed entrepreneurship. You know, Thomas Fichetti wrote this famous book um, explaining with great scholarship on how social inequality was growing. And his solution is, this is a distribution problem. We're going to have to tax the rich more and change social inequality through re distribution of wealth. What if we change the way wealth was distributed in the first place? What a radical thought that would be. What if we created a new halcyon era of entrepreneurship where people, first of all, billions of people are not even in the economy. There are two billion people that have a supercomputer in their pocket connected to a, a, a network that will give them 3G but they don't have a bank account because no bank is going to give them an account because they only own a pig and a couple of chickens. Well, imagine if they could now participate in the global economy, that they could get access to stuff like credit and that they could have savings. This could all be possible too. So this is one topic that I've been, just one, that I've been talking to you about today is prosperity. And there are many others. But this is my little summary of the prosperity. Billions of people coming into the global economy, protecting rights, for example, to your land through immutable records, enabling citizens to monetize and protect their privacy, enabling the, or stopping the remittance ripoff, reinventing financial services, not necessarily to disintermediate the banks, but to create a financial services industry and system that's much more responsive and that has greater transparency and integrity. To create a true sharing economy, unleash the halcyon age of entrepreneurship and transforming foreign aid too. That's a whole other topic. But imagine if you could get foreign aid through smart contracts directly to the people who need the aid, because most of it gets siphoned off on the way down. Now, that's a pretty heady list, and if I had a little more time, I'd give you a list of seven huge showstoppers or potential problems to this whole thing. And I'm not predicting the future here. I'm, people have called me a futurist. I'm not. I believe that the future is not something to be predicted. It's something to be achieved. But we can achieve a very different future here if we will it. And all of these huge challenges and problems that, that come up constantly around this, I always say to people, I say this every day, this problem you've raised, is it, put it in one of two categories. Is this an implementation challenge or is it a reason why this is a bad idea? And everything so far that I've seen goes in the bucket called implementation challenges. This is a good idea if we will do it. So we're at one of those weird turning points, once again, in human history, where we're, we're going to get another kick at the can to rewrite the economic power grid and to make a world that's more peer-to-peer -peer and that's more just and that's more transparent. What an exciting time to be alive. Thank you very much.